نعماتي ومجهول الهوية والصفات كذا كانت حياتي دون معنى أفسرها ككل الكائنات There will be challenges and you will face a lot of obstacles, some of them major obstacles. That was a bit scary. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa So today I decided to speak in Malay, inshallah. The lecture is to be delivered in Malay. So Abba Kabar. Mashallah, mashallah. Namasaya wa al Ibrahim. Sigala puji bagi Allah. Tuhan sikalian alam. Let's switch to English now, guys. <laughs> How are you, everyone? How's everybody? Good, 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 good. Alhamdulillah, mashallah. Bismillah, Rahman, Rahim. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Wa salat wa salam wa sayyid al awalina wa al-akhirin. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa tabi'in. وعلى من تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وارض اللهم عنا معهم أجمعين اللهم أمين رب شرح لي صدري وأسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لسان يفقه قولي سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم My dear respected brothers and sisters in Islam Inshallah I'm going to deal with today's topic in Two parts, inshallah. So the first part of my lecture will be dealing with case studies, stories that I have witnessed myself, people who would come and relate to me their agony, their problems regarding sexual immoralities, and the negative impacts that have been left on them, the scars that were left on them, and how some of them, their lives completely were unfortunately destroyed. And the, the second half would be, inshallah, practical tips on how can we, inshallah, make a positive changes in our lives to make some corrections. Because again, I would repeat what I said yesterday. Everyone in the room knows very well that sexual immoralities is something abhorred, something that is prohibited in Islam. So we don't need to, rem- to, to repeat that again and again. You see, a man came to the Prophet ﷺ, and he told him, O oh, Messenger of Allah, and that, that man is a Muslim, he's a companion, one of the Sahaba, one of the greatest people ever existed. And he told the Prophet wasallam, allow me to commit adultery. Can you imagine? The man coming to the Prophet wasallam, asking for a permission to commit one of the major sins, adultery. Now, the Prophet wasallam, could have easily told him, it's haram. Don't you know what the Qur'an said about adultery? Don't you know the punishment that was revealed in the Qur'an about those who commit adultery? But the Prophet ﷺ knew that the man is not coming to ask whether the act is halal or haram. The man simply was having an issue, was having some weakness in his heart about unlawful women. So the Prophet ﷺ used a different approach a different approach to wake up that man and to facilitate his ways so that he can do the right thing. So when the man told the Prophet ﷺ, allow me, give me permission to commit adultery, the Prophet ﷺ asked him questions. أَتَرْضَاهُ ummik, Do you accept this to happen to your mother? He said, no. How about your sister? Would you like this to happen to your sister? He said, no. Even to your aunt, to your relatives. He said, no. So the Prophet ﷺ reasoned with the man and he told him, other people too don't like these things to happen to their mothers, sisters, and so on and so forth. So telling you that zina is haram wouldn't help those people who are actually infected with zina. It wouldn't help you. It would not solve your problem if he knew that it's haram. Or if you heard me saying it's haram, 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 haram. Because unfortunately amongst our people, may Allah yani, save us all and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the right understanding and the right 
you know, the, the wisdom so that we can deal with those people who have, who need help in this area. Whenever these issues are arise, you find those haram hunters, I call them, the haram hunters, you know. Every time you speak or every, every time you do something wrong, you find somebody telling you, haram, haram. Okay, then what? What is the solution? Some of them, they have, you know, the haram gun in their waist. Like every time, haram. And some of them even have the, uh, the automatic haram gun. Har, you know, there's no, no chance for you to speak. <laughs> yani, for our brothers and sisters who are engaged in da'wah, engaged in the community, you know, spreading goodness, make things easy on the people. The Prophet ﷺ, when he sent two of his companions to Yemen, inviting people to Islam, he gave them, yani, in my opinion, one of the best advice that you, we should adhere to and we should always have in mind. He told them, "Yassira, wa la tuassira, wa bashira, wa la tunafira, wa tatawaa, wa la taqtalifa." You're going to invite people to goodness, to Islam. So make things easy on the people. Do not make things difficult on them. وَبَشِّرَ And give people good news before giving them harsh news. Telling them, tell them what is halal first before listing down to them what is haram. Talk to them about Jannah before scaring them by talking about hellfire. وَتَطَوَعَ And cooperate with one another. Unfortunately, in our time today, even those people who are working in, in da'wah organizations, in Islamic organization, who are supposed to be doing the same work for the sake of Allah, even them, they can't cooperate with one another in the same field. Unfortunately, and sadly. وَلَا تَخْتَلِفَ And do not contradict each other. So, whenever you find someone who's infected with these issues, be kind to them. Learn from the Prophet ﷺ how he dealt with this man who came and asked him about committing adultery. And later on the Prophet ﷺ placed his hand over his chest and he said, Ya Allah, remove the love of unlawful woman, meaning, you know, indulging in these things from his heart. And after that, the man was cured. So the first part of the lecture would be about real cases that happened and then we will give so, such some reminders from the Quran and the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The second part would be inshallah the practical tips what should we do inshallah to become better and to improve until we stay away from these immorality inshallah. The first story on the list was happened few years back. When a brother of mine gave me a call, he gave me a call, and he, I noticed immediately from the first "Assalamu alaikum" that he was not sound or right. There was something wrong. So he told me there is a brother, a young brother in the community had passed away. So I told him, "Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raja'un." We belong to Allah, and to Him we shall return. And the, the brother was so down, like his his voice was so sad and. He was a bit, you know, down and I reminded him, Akhi, this is true, this is gonna happen. I thought that I was, you know, comforting him. But he said, that's not the issue, I know, I know. I said, so what's wrong? He said, he died in a hotel room. They discovered his body in a hotel room. And the girl who was with him, she left a, a note at the reception and she ran away, she disappeared. And the note says that while we were engaging in sexual activities, he collapsed and he passed away. And wallahi, my brothers and sisters, when I heard this, I said, Ya Allah, we just mentioned one of the narrations yesterday that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that the one who dies upon any action will be resurrected on a day of judgment upon the same action. I was asking, Ya Allah, grant us a beautiful end. And you make our last deed the best before we meet you. So what are the chances for those who engage in these activities that the angel of death might strike anytime? And the angel of death doesn't knock doors. He doesn't seek permission from you. He will just come and take your soul by the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But this was not the whole story. 
The whole story finished by when the brother mentioned the name of this young man. He told me, this is the brother who passed away. And I was at shock. I told him, I'm going to call you back. Because few months back, before this incident, this brother came to me. 24 years old. And he opened up to me about his struggles. And he told me that he's suffering from internet addiction, particularly, explicitly, pornography. And he has been addicted since he was 8 years old. Like he was hooked on porn when he was that young. And he remained in that cycle for all these years. And as I mentioned yesterday briefly in the Q&A, once you are addicted to pornography, what happens is, the person himself or herself, because many people think that this is a guy thing, this is a man thing. No, there are also sisters who are infected with this problem. May Allah save us all. The problem is that once you are hooked on porn, there is a chemical reaction, a hormone that fires up in your brain, reminding you of this activity. It's like if you like sweet food, there is a hormone that pops up in your brain, reminding you of eating sweet, like me. I love sweet, so I always keep on eating sweet. That's why I'm expanding in the lilay. <laughs> that, that hormone calls dopamine. One of the chemicals or the hormones in our brains that is responsible for your pleasure, responsible for your happiness and excitement. Now those who are addicted mostly don't know about this. All what they know is that they are out of control at the moment of sitting in front of their computers and browsing these websites and these images. They don't want it, but they can't get rid of it. Most people who emailed me regarding this matter, they always start their introduction by saying, I have tried my best to quit, but they, I cannot. I don't know what to do. Because you have been training your brain for many years to see these images. And the problem is, as I said yesterday, you will start with one type of pornography, and things will get worse day by day, month by month. It will get worse. You're not happy with what you're watching anymore. Until you reach to the point that you're not satisfied whatsoever with what you're watching on the screen, you want the real thing. You want to act out now. And that's what happened to the brother. That is exactly what happened with him. And he was telling me that he had committed this act of zina a couple of times because of pornography. And the last act was what? Zina. I prayed for that brother, wallahi. Because I said, Ya Allah, you know that he was weak. You know that he was fighting. You know that he was trying to repent and go back to you. You know that. So show mercy to him. Have mercy upon his soul. The grieving thing that happened to this brother is that no one in the community wanted to offer janazah for him. I was praying for him and I, I asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive him and overlook his sins. Because he was weak. He wanted to change. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept We never know. We never know. But the lesson is, my brothers and sisters, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have showed mercy to that brother, will he show mercy to you? If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided to forgive that brother and to wipe out his sins because he was struggling and fighting, will that exact scenario happen to you? The answer is unknown. We don't know. So what are the chances for us to die upon doing that which is shameful? And what are the chances for us to die doing that which is beneficial and pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? We have to consider that really seriously. Many people are taking things for granted. The danger thing is that the Prophet ﷺ informed us that the man or the woman who commit adultery, at the moment, at the moment of committing adultery, they are not believers. The Prophet ﷺ said, an adulterer is not a believer at the moment of committing adultery. Iman is taken away from you. Faith is taken away from you right there at that very particular moment.
And as we said also briefly yesterday, many people when we say zina, they always think about the actual act of intercourse, the haram activity. Many people think that this is the haram. But watching people having intercourse is halal. Yeah, th- people think this way. Wallahi, I received sometimes horrible emails that I can't reply. I can't, you know, I don't know what to say. A sister is complaining that her husband is pushing her to watch actually these things so that they can enhance their sexual activities. He's inviting her, her, his own wife to watch that which is unlawful for his own pleasure. They think that this is halal. It's better than zina. Wallahi, it is never better than zina. It will lead you to zina. Hundreds of emails from brothers who are already married because of the act of pornography, because they cannot protect their gaze, they don't look into the halal, rather they look at the haram. Even though next to them are the lawful wives that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had blessed them with, still they go out and they commit zina with other people. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, Iman will be you know, taken away from you at that very particular moment. When you look at these things, when you watch these haram, when you go out with your boyfriend, boyfriend, girlfriend, I love him brother. What can I do? I love him. The power of love. And sometimes the people will ask us questions like, you know, they wanted us to give them what they want. Brother, can I chat with, uh, chat with my boyfriend? I don't touch his hand. I'm just chatting. What do you say, sister? You know, you know, you know. Why are you asking me? Because she wants a permission. From someone with beard. <laughs> yeah, she wants a, a permission. Yeah, go on, go and chat. That's what you heard. Like the, the, the example I gave about the cigarette, the man who wanted to quit smoking, who wanted to, uh, you know, who came uh, attacking me, said, don't tell me it's haram. So what do you want me to tell you? Yani, eat, eat banana? <laughs> what do you want me to tell you? It's haram. All the scholars around the world say it's haram because you're damaging your own body that Allah had given you. Again, in another narration, the Prophet ﷺ said, when a man fell in adultery, when someone commit adultery, faith leaves him, leaves his heart, and overshadow him. But if he frees himself, then his faith will be restored. So the point here, there is a chance, alhamdulillah. There is an opportunity for you to repent. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Qur'an, قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَتُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ جَمِيعًا إِنَّهُ هُوَ الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ Allahu Akbar. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, tell them, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Tell them, tell my slaves who have transgressed against their own souls, who have committed sins day and night, especially when they are alone, secretly, doing that which is displeasing to Allah, which is abhorred, which is haram. And yet Allah is giving you chance after chance. He did not yet cause you to die upon that haram. Tell those people who have lost hope, despair not from the mercy of Allah. My brothers and sisters, so long as we are breathing, there is a chance for correction. There is a chance for repentance. Allahu Akbar. Indeed, Allah is the most forgiving, most merciful. On another occasion, a sister came with her mother. And the mother was crying, Wallahi, it makes my heart bleed. What is the story, sister? She said, it's my fault. The mother started by saying, it's my fault. She admitted that what happened to her daughter is actually her own fault. What was the problem? The sister, the daughter started to speak. She said, I grew up watching movies with my parents. Watching, you know, TV series every day. My mother, all of a sudden, when I was 18 or 19 years old, She became more religious, my father became more religious, and they don't want me to watch movies, they don't want me to watch TV series, but it was too late. 
With the rise of devices, internet devices and so on and so forth, I would go and sneak and watch movies and watch TV series day and night. And I became addicted to them. And that is the danger of movies and TV series and MTV songs and music and so on and so forth. Unconsciously, you will imitate their actions in real life later on. You will imitate their actions. If you don't, you know, quit these things, Wallahi, the first scene, the first incident will take place in your life, unconsciously, you will fall into the same thing. You will act out what happened in, in these movies. And I have two, two stories yani, happened to me as well. In the dark days, I used to love Indian movies. Don't laugh. <laughs> And when I was young, Indian movies were like, wow. Yeah? <laughs> and don't tell anyone about this, okay? <laughs> it's between us, yeah. So Indian movies, and the, the actor that I used to love the most at that time was Amitabh Bachchan. Okay, so he's the most popular actor, actor in India, Bollywood stuff. And there was that movie, that one movie that left a memory in my brain for so long. I watched that movie like plenty of times. It was called Mard. So that movie started like this. The man is trying to protect his, you know, village and his family and his infant child from those Britishers who were coming to attack that village. So he uh, put his wife on a horse and he wanted to give her the son. But he is afraid that maybe they will get lost. So he wanted to create a sign on his son's body so that he can remember him later on, recall him or make an identification about him when he see him later on. So out of all ideas in the world, and he could have put a ribbon, he could have write something, marker or something like that. Out of all these ideas, he chose the most awkward idea. He took a knife. A knife. And he was an infant. And he starts writing the, the, you know, the name of that child on his chest with the knife. Mard. And the blood starts coming out from that infant little flesh. And the boy was crying. And the music, the effect of the music. A'udhu <laughs> billah. The lady, there is, in, that, in these Indian movies, anyone uh, used to watch Indian movies? Raise your hand. Inna lillahi wa inna ila so there is that lady, that old lady, who always, they brought her, they bring her always in these movies to sing in the background, to create that emotion. And she, while the music is running, and she's like that, ah, you know, <laughs> something. <laughs> and the people are crying, and my mom is crying, and I'm telling mom, we have problems already, why are you crying? Why are we bringing these movies here? Anyway, the lady took her son and she ran with her horse and the boy was in the river, you know, up and down and, uh, and she fell down and she became blind. And Anyway, 30 years later, the writing, 30 years later, Amitabh became a grown man, the writing still there. But it's, it's now metal, it's not, it's not blood anymore, it's, it's, it's iron. Don't go watch that movie, okay? So... One night I woke up, and when I woke up, my brother says, Wallahi, this is a true story. I will give you my sister's telephone number. You go and ask her. <laughs> She's a witness. Today. And I woke up one night, I am Amitabh Bachchan. <laughs> no one could have ever convinced me at that time that I'm Wa'il Ibrahim. I was Amitabh. I was actually not Amitabh, I was Mard. And I walked to the toilet, and I searched in my father's stuff. And I found that little blade. And I looked into the mirror. And the music started working in my brain. <laughs> and I wrote on my chest, Mard. But at that time it was in Arabic, you know. <laughs> this, is, this is how these movies have got an impact on you. And if these scenes are sexual by nature, you will do the same. Wallahi, you will do the same. We are learning from these dirty movies. We are learning from them. And we are applying the, these actions in real life. This sister and her mother told me that there was a TV series that was very popular. And I believe if I mention the name of that TV series, and if I said how many of you have watched it, 
I am 100% sure that the majority of the people in this venue will raise up their hands. And this TV series runs for 10 years. Yeah, I know. And in this, in this TV series, the people, the actors and the actresses, were bonding together for a long time. They were neighbors. They were living together, actually. And in that TV... Yeah, I know. <laughs> and in that TV series, everyone have committed sexual immorality with every other one. All of them. They exchange each other. That, and this is one of the favorite ever TV series ever produced, the most successful. And who watched them? Who are watching them? Muslims. Man, let us be honest. And this sister was addicted to this TV series and she watched it many countless times. And in the campus, in the university, she got to know that man. She fell in love with him. And she said, touching is haram. We just sit together. Okay. We sit together. A couple of days, touching become halal. But hugging is haram. A few weeks later, hugging is okay. But that's it, okay? No more. After that, sexual immorality started. And it becomes the norm. It becomes okay. Because I love her, she loved me, and so on and so forth. The impact of these things upon you, my brothers and sisters, is wallahi, wallahi, wallahi. You will never become a good Muslim. You will never become a better Muslim while watching these things. They are programming you. Especially these TV series that comes every day on a particular time. They studied psychology. They know. They know how addiction actually is formed. They tell us that addiction is something, if you, if you want to be addicted, and this is not a tip, but this is how the people discover that addiction is actually formed by performing a certain action regularly on a certain time, every day or every week on a particular time. That's why those who are addicted to pornography, when I ask them, what time are you normally watching? They say, past midnight, when everybody is asleep. Why? Because... Not only because there is no one around, but he accustomed himself or herself to watch at that particular time. So the dopamine that we talked about earlier will be fired up at that very particular time. What is the cure for that, by the way? Is to perform a healthier action on the, at the same time. To perform a healthier action at the same time and to force yourself to do that which is right at that very particular time. And create that habit, that new habit. One day I was watching, a movie. I asked you a question yesterday, remember I told you who amongst you watching movie? Can we see hands again? And don't worry, the mufti also is not here. Raise up your hand if you're still watching movies, TV series. Don't be shy. Wallahi, we are all falling into this error. Okay, many people. Okay, by a show of hands, how many of you have watched any movie in your entire life where there is a girl had fallen in love with a boy? Raise up your hand. How many of you, put down your hand. How many of you have watched the same movie where the boy was actually coming from a poor background, but the sister from a very rich background? Raise up your hand. They always make us poor, Sheikh. How many of you have watched the same movie where the boy proposed to marry that girl and he was rejected because of his financial status? Raise up your hand. MashaAllah, MashaAllah. It seems that we have watched the same movie. <laughs> How many of you have watched the same exact movie where the girl decided to run away and leave her parents for the sake of her boyfriend? One day I was watching that movie with my grandma. And in, uh, but the Arabic version of the movie, I was born in Egypt, right? So in every culture you'll see that kind of movie. Promoting the haram relationship. Promoting it in movies and TV series all the time. Watch any movie, you will see a love story there where you will feel crying for the, you know. <laughs> so one day, I was watching that movie and the girl in the movie, the actress, decided to leave home, to run. And the boyfriend is waiting for her with flowers. And if that actor, he's a singer, he will be singing all the time for her. And of course, the sisters watching movies say, how I wish to meet a brother who will love me like that and sing for me all the time. <laughs> I want to ask the brothers, even if your voice is beautiful, will you ever sing to the one you love? 
and wait for her outside, say, oh, I love you, I love you. Will you do ever these things? That creates, you know, creates a picture, in the, in the, especially in the sister's mind, that this is the model that I wanted to marry. This is the man that, you know, of my dream. So the girl entered her father's room, wanted to steal his car key, so that she can run away with her boyfriend. So she entered, and of course, the director wanted to create that suspense, so the door, when it's open, it's like... <laughs> and the father, the father started to turn his side as if he's disturbed with the voice. And all of a sudden, my grandma raised up her hand. Ya Allah! <laughs> Don't let the father wake up, please! <laughs> This, <laughs> this is what they wanted to teach us. This is what they wanted to teach you sisters, to neglect your parents for the sake of someone who you just met few weeks, few months back. That's what they wanted to teach you sister, to commit illegal sexual activities with, with someone who's not your husband, who's not your lawful husband. That's what they wanted to teach you. So they made my grandma and all of us feel sympathy for the haram. Yeah, that's why she make dua. She's begging Allah, don't let him wake up. Let the girl go with the haram guy. Can you see the danger now of this? The impact of this sexual immorality? I was just in, in a particular country and they told me that there is a boy and a girl, they committed suicide together. Why? Because their parents did not allow them to get married. They rejected the marriage, so they killed themselves. Again, from where they got this idea? It's there in the movies. It's there in the movies. Of course, this is not a justification to commit suicide. This is something, yani, uh, one of the biggest haram actions in Islam, to, co to end your, your, your life by yourself. And of course, also part of the guilt is shared by parents. Yani parents are making things difficult on those who wanted to get married and do the halal thing, right? The exaggeration in, in, in asking for dowry, for mahar, is something, yani I asked here, is something, how much dowry here, the minimum? The sisters will know better, because the brothers don't want to pay anyway. <laughs> but in many cultures, people are exaggerating in asking for money, so the people, the, the men who are just graduated and they wanted to, you know, engage in halal relationship, they don't see that we are facilitating the halal for them, so they go for the haram. So we cannot put the blame, all the blame on youth, on youngsters, we should also put the blames on parents who are making marriages, making the halal difficult. The haram becomes very accessible, very affordable, it's absolutely free, and the halal becomes more, much more expensive, and the, the guys cannot afford, what can they do? Parents should come and talk to their children and tell them, if you wanted to get married, tell me, I will help you out. I hope that this yani, something the people here will consider seriously. It's not just about the speech that we came to, to deliver and go. It's, it's really, we wanted to create some positive changes in, in, in our lives. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa told us that whoever fornicates or drink wine, Allah takes off his faith from him as a man takes off his shirt from over his head so i believe the community share the responsibility here there is no justification if marriage if marriage becomes difficult there is no justification for fornication and zina and parents also share part of that guilt by not facilitating the halal and making it easy on the people but the bottom line here if you step if you cross the boundaries, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take that iman. The most precious thing Allah had given us, Allah will take it back. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, الْيَوْمَ أَكْمَلْتُ لَكُمْ دِينَكُمْ وَأَكْمَمْتُ عَلَيْكُمْ نَعْمَتِي وَرَضِيتُ لَكُمُ الْإِسْلَامَ دِينًا This day I have perfected your religion for you. I have completed my favor upon you and I have chosen Islam for you to be your way of life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who perfected, 
completed and chosen that faith for us. And once Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala perfected, completed and chosen, then His choice is the best. But if you don't deserve it, Allah will take that back. Allah will take it back, my brothers and sisters. The most valuable thing, the most beautiful favor that Allah had bestowed upon us is Islam. Is that beautiful deen that prevents us from worshipping anything beside Him, the Creator of all. Yet sometimes we just go with the wind and surrender to our desires. And as a result, Allah will say, okay, no more, no more faith for you, no more iman for you. Everyone in this venue have experienced at certain point in his life or in her life, the sweetness of faith, the sweetness of iman. Maybe in a prostration with sincerity. Maybe in a, in a long dua. Maybe during reading the Qur'an. They feel the sweetness of iman. They, they tear up, they cry from the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every single person of us. But sometimes that feeling is, is vanished. Sometimes it's not there. People will come and tell me, brother, motivate me, give me some advice, give me this motivational, you know, doses, so that I can do something. I said, my brothers and sisters, you don't need to be motivated to do that which is right. You don't need to be motivated, wallahi. If you rely on motivations alone, you are not going anywhere. Because this conference itself, is not going to last more than two days. That's it. And we are going back home. And you will be here left alone, going back again to your normal life. So the same feelings that you have today at that very moment and also during Mufti's speech is going to fade away. We are just giving you that little push to take an action. We are the boats, the ships, but you are the captain. Without you, you're not going to go any destination. So motivations alone, if you rely on them, you will never be able to correct and to make positive changes in your life. What is missing here is the action. What is missing here is the willpower. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَقُلِ amalu And say, tell them, O oh Muhammad, work hard. Do actions. Tell them that is the key for success. That is what we need to do, is to act. Not just to be motivated and sit back and listen to an inspirational talk. And then when we go home, we switch on the TV, we start doing the same thing, as if we have never heard a warning, as if we have never heard a hadith from the Prophet telling us to stay away from that which is haram. We read in the Quran that one of the characteristics of the believers is what? And when the believers hear the commands of Allah, they say what? Sami'na, we hear. And we obey. But nowadays the Muslims have become the people of Sami'na only. We listen very well. But when it comes to Ata'na, when it comes to obedience, we have some difficulties. Shaitan, Satan, Iblis, he had promised his shayateen, his descendants, he had promised that he will crown them and he will honor them, and he will make them closer to him, if they were successful to trick you into that which is prohibited. So, a Satan goes to Iblis and tell him that I have been successful in creating hatred between a husband and a wife, and as a result, they got divorced. Iblis will respond by saying, you have done nothing, he will marry again. And, and that's normal, right? Men, they just marry. <laughs> Another Satan will come to Iblis and tell him that I have become successful in making a separation, a hatred between a brother and his fellow Muslim. You say you have done nothing. They will reconcile. Another one will come to the Iblis and say that I have been successful in making such and such commit adultery. And he said, you have done very well. And he will crown that shaitan. And he will make him closer to him. Because of you, you will make shaitan proud. You will make satans proud. Would you want to do that, my brothers and sisters? So those who are into relationships, those who are 
into boyfriend and girlfriend thing. Calling each other day and night, texting one another day and night. Let us, let, let me be very frank with you. I never say this is halal or haram because as I said earlier, I am not a scholar. But for this, if you will ask me, I will say absolutely, it's absolutely prohibited. And you know it. That's why you're doing it in secret. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ in defining sin and good deed, he said, the sin is that which you do it secretly and you don't want the people to know about it. That is sin. That is sin. So if you are serious about this relationship, today, tonight, call that person and tell him from now on, we want it to halalize our relationship. Yeah. yeah if, if we may use that <laughs> word. Halalize it, make it lawful. How to make it lawful involve family members. Talk to your parents. I'm interested in that person. And I don't want to commit zina. I don't want to go beyond the limits of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So help me out. If you can't, stay away from that person. Simple as that, stay away. If you want it to be a better Muslim. If you want it to be a productive Muslim. Learn from the people who run away from just looking at someone who was bathing. Thalabah ibn Abdul Rahman. One of the young companions who used to serve the Prophet ﷺ from time to time, buying stuff from here, buying buy things from him, and so on and so forth. And one day he was going to fulfill one of the requests of the Prophet ﷺ, and he saw a house, you know, the door was open, so out of curiosity he went closer, and there was a curtain, and the curtain was lifted, and he saw a naked woman bathing. That's all. And immediately he remembered Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he lowered his gaze and he ran. What will you do, young people, men? What will you do if this happened? There are people who have microscopes now in balconies and windows just to sneak and see people who are changing their garments. Intentionally, people will go to watch these things. And now we don't need because the internet is providing it all. So he ran away. And he said he will never go back to ret- and return to the Prophet ﷺ because for sure Allah will reveal a Qur'an, a verse about me telling the Prophet ﷺ that I am a hypocrite. So he ran away weeping. He disappeared, he vanished. The Prophet ﷺ was worried about him. Every time he will sit with the companions, he will tell them, where is, where is Ta'laba? Where did he go? He sent Umar ibn al-Khattab, Salman al-Farisi to look for him everywhere. They couldn't find him. After many days, he sent them again to look. And they saw people down the mountain and they asked and they give the description of Ta'laba. And he said, are you, do you mean the guy who always cry? There is a boy with this description is sitting over there in the mountain, in the cave. He just come every sunset or sunrise for food and we give him the food. And every time he come, he cry. So Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu ardan, his other companions, they hide behind a rock until he came down and they went up to him. What happened? Where did you go? He was so concerned. He told the Prophet, he told the companions, did Allah reveal any ayah about me? Was the Prophet informed that I am a hypocrite? He said, wallahi, we don't know. But the Prophet ﷺ wanted you to come over. He said, no, leave me alone. But Umar ibn Khattab being, you know, mashallah, tough. MashaAllah, companion. They carried him back. Yeah. Because there's a command. Bring him to me. But he refused to go to the Prophet ﷺ's house. So he went up to his home. Crying, crying. Just because of a look. And then the Prophet ﷺ, the merciful, the mercy to mankind, Allah. He went up to him. Learn, my brothers and sisters, to be merciful for, to those who have committed shameful activities and undesirable behaviors. We have these weaknesses. He went up to him and the Prophet ﷺ told him, what happened? Where did you go? He said, did Allah reveal anything about me? Did Allah mention that I'm a hypocrite? He said, no. He told him no. So he cried, he wept. And the Prophet ﷺ said, what, he didn't tell him, what did you do? Did you do something haram? He didn't investigate about the sin, he just let go. And he put his head, the Prophet ﷺ took his head and he sat down and he put his head on his lap. And the man told him, remove my head from your lap, O Messenger of Allah, I don't deserve it, I'm dirty. 
He said, no, just sleep. And he told him, oh, messenger of Allah, I feel like there are ants creeping between my bones and my skin. And the Prophet ﷺ told him, is that what you feel? He said, yes. So the Prophet ﷺ told him, this is death. This is death. And after a while, he took the shahada and he died. In his funeral, they saw the Prophet ﷺ walking on his toes. And the people started to make a space for the Prophet ﷺ, yet the Prophet ﷺ kept on walking on his toes. Umar ibn Khattab anhu told him, O oh, Messenger of Allah, the people already opened ways for you, why are you walking on your toes? He said, by Allah, the angels are attending his funeral. There is no space. Repent, my brothers and sisters, before it is too late, repent. A man ran away because he felt that guilt of a look at that which is haram. How about you and me? How much images, movies, and that which is unpleasant, how many times we have seen these things and to an extent that sometimes we say Allahu Akbar in our salah, and these images comes to our brain, comes to our mind. How many times? And yet we are reluctant to repent. So, the practical part of this Lecture, inshallah, will be six things. Briefly, inshallah, in the remaining time. Six things to do in order for you to create a shift and do you know, things seriously, inshallah. And we will use the word strive. We will use the word strive to make it easy for you to remember. So each point, inshallah, each point will be linked to the letters of the word strive. So what is the first letter? Now wake up. What's the first letter? S, inshallah, S for seriousness. Be serious about making a change. Be serious about moving away from that which is haram. Look at the examples of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his companions. When it comes to an action that would please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they used to compete. They used to compete because they know that Jannah is for real men. And when I say men here, I mean men and women. Jannah is not cheap. The Prophet ﷺ said that there is a commodity for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that commodity is not cheap. In the silat Allah ghaliyah. The commodity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very precious, is very expensive. And that commodity is Jannah. It's not cheap. It's guaranteed to those who are true to their faith. Among the believers are true men, true women who have been honest and true to their covenant with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they never changed any of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed. And they never changed anything about that covenant. So be serious. Look at how Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu arda, when, we, when he was the Khalifa of the Muslims, he used to go and clean the house of a, an old blind lady. Clean her house when he was the leader. Bathe the children, cook for them, wash the dishes. And Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu arda, used to go after him to see what is he doing. And one day he entered after... Abu Bakr left and he asked the lady, who is that man who was here with you? She said, I don't know. She didn't know that he was Abu Bakr, the leader. He didn't tell her. He didn't tell her, by the way, I'm going to cook for you, wash the dishes, and you just vote for me. <laughs> she didn't even know that he was Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu arda. And Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu arda, he asked the lady, did you give him any wage, any price? She said, no. Then he cried. Uh, Umar ibn Khattab cried radiallahu anhu arda. And he went out and he said that famous quote, لَقَدْ أَتْعَبْتَ الْخُلَفَاءَ مِنْ بَعْدِكَ يَا أَبَا بَكْرِ You have made it so difficult for the leaders to come after you, O Abu Bakr. That, that was something yani, different, different. So S for seriousness. What is the next letter? T is for today and now. For today and now to make a decision. For today and now to decide to go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to do that which is right. Don't ever wait until tomorrow. Today and now in that very venue. 
make a decision now, write it on the notebooks that, that are given. Today, I'm going to change. Today, I'm going to put a plan to do that which is positive, to do that which is halal, because we want it to remain upon that path until the end, inshallah. Today, don't ever wait for later. The later of yesterday is today. How many years we have been saying later, inshallah? How many years people wanted to quit smoking? Always say, inshallah. Pray, pray for me, brother. <laughs> he will be smoking and blowing the smoke in your face and telling you, pray for me, Allah guide me. <laughs> I really want to quit. <laughs> really? Seriously? You are enjoying it. <laughs> Crash that pack in your pocket. Crash it and throw it away and say, from now on, no smoking. You will have a headache a bit, a little bit, for the sake of Allah, ya akhi. For the sake of Allah, have some headache. The companions were tortured, were killed. And they never complained. You will have some headache for a few days. Ya akhi, for the sake of Allah, some of your sins will be wiped out because of that headache, because of that daziness. But don't go back to that which is haram. Khalas, today is the day. Don't ever delay your tawbah or else shaitan will be standing on your grave and laughing at you. Because you kept on delaying your tawbah. Tomorrow, inshallah, inshallah, inshallah. And as we all know, we use inshallah in the wrong way. Inshallah could mean yes. Inshallah could mean also maybe. Inshallah could mean yes and no. I don't know. It's like if you ask somebody, are you coming to the conference? He can tell you, inshallah. <laughs> <laughs> there is no intention. There is no any intention behind saying inshallah. No, learn to take a decision. And then say Allah, uh, inshaAllah. Learn to say, I'm coming to the conference. Make the necessary arrangement. Set your alarms. You decided to come. No one is going to prevent you. After you decided, say, inshaAllah. Because maybe Allah is the one to prevent you from coming. But don't use inshaAllah yani loosely. Today. The next letter is? What is that? I love the R of the Malaysians. <laughs> It's like neither R nor A. It's like something in between. R for repentance. What is the difference between repentance and asking for forgiveness? What is the difference between tawbah and istighfar? Tawbah is to quit the sin and to commit never to do it again in the future. That is tawbah. So tawbah is related to the future. What is istighfar? Seeking Allah's forgiveness is to ask Allah to forgive you from whatever you have done in the past. It is as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted us to be in a constant state of repentance and forgiveness, past and future, past and future. The Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa as mentioned by Dr. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi yesterday, he himself, the chosen one, the best of all creation, he himself, he used to seek forgiveness every day, 100 times. How about you and I? Don't we need to repent? Don't we need to go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Repent today and every day. But start today, my brother and sister. Repentance. The next letter? What's that? Abba Kabar. Istiqama. The next letter is for istiqama. To remain consistently on the straight path. To ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to supplicate. Allahumma inni as'aluka thabata fil amr. Oh Allah, I ask you to grant me steadfastness upon this deen, upon this affair. And I know it is challenging. It is very challenging to remain upon the straight path all the time. To be consistent, it's difficult. But there is a key here. There is a key here, solution. How to become consistent, how to become always on the straight path. Number one, good and righteous company. Those people, those who when you, when you meet, they always remind you of Allah and His commands. But if you meet those people who tell you, let's go to cinema, let's do this, let's talk to that, let's look at this. And if these things are haram invitations, stay away from those people. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, Al-mar'u ala deeni khalilih. A person will be always inclined to follow the religion or the way of life of his friend. So be careful who your friends are. Look carefully. Look carefully in the index of your phone. Those friends scroll and check the names and re try to recall incidents that took place between you and them. 
and ask yourself, are these the true friends that will bring me closer to Allah or they will make me stay away from the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And if you want to remain consistent, here is another point. Dua, dua, dua. The forgotten tool that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given the Muslims to change qadr. The only tool that can change the destiny of Allah. The qadr of Allah is dua, supplication. Ya Allah, change me. Ya Allah, I wanted to go back to you. I am weak. Help me out. That's why in Surah Al-Fatiha, every time we pray, we say what? اِهْدِنَا الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ Guide us to the straight path. Show me the way. Take me there. Keep me there. That's the meaning of اِهْدِنَا الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ Because the Prophet ﷺ informed us that the hearts of people are in between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's finger and he can just flip them the way he wish at any time. So ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep your heart firm. Ya muqallib al-qulub, thabbit qalbi ala deenik. Oh, turner of the hearts. This is one of the du'as of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa You can use it. Oh, turner of the hearts, strengthen my heart upon your deen. Make my heart firm. Make me like Omar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu arda, the man when he embraced Islam, he changed the course of history, of the course of Islamic history. It was the first time ever Muslims would be able to practice Islam in, in the open. Because of one man, Omar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu arda. Istiqama. Be like Abdullah ibn Hudhaf al-Sahmi. And I wanted you, that is your homework. So yesterday's homework, how many of you have made the homework of yesterday? How many of you have kissed the mother's hand and father's? Hasbunallah wa ni'mal wakil. Inshallah coming. Tonight inshallah you have two homeworks. Those who didn't do the homework of yesterday, you will do it today. Now, the homework of today is two parts. Number one is to memorize that name, the name of that companion, Abdullah. Ibn Hudhafa al-Sahmi, the man who was sent with more than 300, per, or he was captured in one of the battle, he and 300 of the companion at the time of Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu arda, and he was captured by a Christian nation, and the Christian king was very interested to convert him to Christianity. So he told him, embrace Christianity and I'm going to give you half of my wealth. He told him, Wallahi, listen to his words. He said, Wallahi, if you give me all your wealth and the wealth of the entire planet, I will never leave the deen of Muhammad for a blinking of an eye. How firm is that? They jailed him. They prevented him from eating food and water for three days. And at the end, they gave him pork and wine. And he didn't touch them. And they told him, you will die, you're weak. His neck was twisted out of hunger. He said, by Allah, pork and wine in my condition is halal because I have no option. But I will never let anyone say that Abdullah ibn Hudhaf al-Sahmi have eaten that which is haram. Very firm. And then they sent after him a prostitute. Here is the power of iman. That when, when, when you see these things, you will remain more firm. You will run away. They sent after him a prostitute who ran after him within his cell. And he ran away from her until the girl became bored. And she went out and he, she said what? He is a rock. He's not moving. He's not moving sexually. Doesn't mean that he have any problem. It means that he have iman. He's, a, he's like the quality of Yusuf alayhi salam who was running from the wife of Al-Aziz, because she was seducing him for something really bad. Be like him, be like Abdullah ibn Hudhaf al-Sahmi, be like Yusuf alayhi salam, be like Maryam, may Allah be pleased with her. Be like those people. Don't look at actors and actresses and then imitate them. They are not our role models, my brothers and sisters, wake up. Look at Abdullah ibn Hudhaf al-Sahmi. They brought two of his companions and they dipped them into boiling oil. To an extent that the man said that I saw my companion's bones were separated and they were floating on the surface of the boiling oil. Then he cried. And when he cried, the Christian king said, are you ready now to become a Muslim? He said, no. He said, so why didn't you cry? He said, I cried because I remember that I have got only one soul. If you killed me, that's it. I will just vanish. I will just die once. 
So I wish to have a hundred souls so that you can kill me a hundred times and in every time I will die for the sake of Allah. It's a different quality, different quality people, different quality Muslims. The king gave up and he told Abdullah ibn Hudhaf al-Sahmi, okay, I will let you go free on one condition, kiss my head. He told him, I will never even allow you to kiss my head. Look how firm and stubborn, yani one of the stubborn companions, Vashal. He said, okay. Now the king started to looking embarrassed in front of all his soldiers. They can see that because of Iman, because of Islam, that prisoner is more powerful than the king. Because of his firmness and steadfastness, that's what we need. He told him, okay, kiss my head and I will let you go free and with you 60 of your prisoners, of the prisoners. He said, no. He said, okay, kiss my head, please. <laughs> and I will let you go and with you 120. He said, no, 300. He said, okay. Can you imagine? All, the whole lot. And then he told him, and then he went up to him and he kissed his forehead. On the way back to Medina, some people started to talk about Abdullah ibn Hudhaf al-Sahmi. They didn't like the fact that he kissed the forehead of the Christian king. Who heard it? Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu arda. And he said, by Allah, it is a duty upon every Muslim to kiss the forehead of Abdullah ibn Hudhaf al-Sahmi. Do you know what is the homework now? Anyone can guess the homework? Anyone can guess the homework? Not to kiss my head. <laughs> the homework inshallah is that when we get to Jannah, say inshallah, say ameen. Inshallah, may Allah make all the people here, inshallah, the inhabitants of Jannah. Not any Jannah with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. When we get there inshallah, and when we meet the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam at the pool, and when we get that beautiful drink that will make us inshallah never ask for water anymore, let us go and look for Abdullah ibn Hudhaf al-Sahmi. And let us go up and kiss his forehead. That's your homework that you will report inshallah in Jannah. Ameen. And for the sisters, I think you can kiss him in Jannah. Yani. <laughs> Last two points, I know I ran out of time. Two points inshallah. Uh, after I, can you remind me of the le next letter? V is for virtues. Be a well-mannered person. I was talking to one of the shiuch yesterday and I told him that, mashallah, what I like about Malaysians is the manners, the ethics. He said, not really. <laughs> I said, no, I never experienced anything. He said, there are certain things here and there that is not according to the manners that are prescribed and practiced by the Prophet ﷺ. So we need to improve that. You heard Dr. Muhammad Salah, I will never repeat, I will not repeat again when he talk about manners. The manners, one of the qualities that will bring you closer to the Prophet wasallam. and the last letter is E, and that is for emulating your role models, emulating the Prophet wasallam. The companions back then, they would not only emulate the Prophet wasallam in his prayer, in his acts of worship, they will actually and literally, they will emulate him in every little thing, to an extent that one day, the Prophet ﷺ was in the battlefield praying in the shoes. And all the companions behind him were in the shoes. And all of a sudden the Prophet ﷺ removed his shoes while he is praying. And he continued to pray. And what happened next? All the companions, they started removing their shoes. Now, logically speaking, logically speaking, the people behind the Prophet ﷺ, should ask him later on after they finish the prayer, O oh Prophet of Allah, why did you remove your shoes during the salah? True? That is the logical expectation. But none of them opened their mouths. None of them asked the Prophet ﷺ, why did you remove the shoes? In fact, the Prophet was the one who asked them, why did you remove your shoes? So they say, we saw you removing them, so we removed them. That was the simple answer. That was sufficient for them to obey the Messenger of Allah. Because we saw you doing them, we did it as well. Umar ibn Khattab, when he looked at the black stone, he said, I know that you are a black st that you are, you are, you are a stone, you cannot harm nor benefit. And had I not seen the Prophet ﷺ kissing you, I would have never kissed you. 
We need to go back to that state, my brothers and sisters. We need to emulate the Prophet Sallallahu and his companions. Only then you will be protected from the devil. Only then you will be protected by Allah Subhanahu wa Taala from that evil desires that you are, you know, remembering from time, one time to another. My brothers and sisters in Islam, I wanted to remind you that if you fell into the sin of zina, into the sin of all types of zina, whether it is introductory or whether it's the action itself. Introductory referring to relationships, haram relationships, innocent messages, what we call innocent, that leads to the actual act of adultery and zina. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us all. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us among the people who hear the commands of Allah and follow them to the best of our ability. Jazakumullahu khayran. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.